Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, I come to you first as an entrepreneur and uh, then as somebody that works at Google. The interesting part of my experience that I would like to share is my entrepreneurship experience. But also since I went back at Google, uh, I've learned a lot about what I call failure and came up with this concept uh, I call pretotyping. And here's what I'm today I'm going to tell to you about. So I'm going to tell you about my recent experiences, say for the past 12 years, to put some context and so you know why you should listen uh, uh, to me. In 1999 to 2001, I founded my first VC-backed startup. It wasn't my first startup, but it's the first time that I actually took other people's money. And since I come from Italy, I was very nervous, because in Italy, when you take people's money, uh, <laughs> they come back for it. Uh, so we got, I did a $3 million, uh, $3 million Series A. And after 18 months, the company received a term sheet to be acquired for $100 million. So I thought, hey, this is easy. <laughs> so I, I spent the obligatory one year at the acquiring company. And then I thought, well, what's fun? I didn't have a great idea, so I went to Google. And uh, at Google, I was there, the first engineering director. They hired me as adult supervision. They had no idea how wrong they were. But uh, after a while, they gave me a number of projects. And eventually, they said, you know, we would like to do this ads thing. You know, it's time we start monetizing. So I was the engineering director in charge of AdWords. I remember launching a very frantic period. Uh, but then when I launched it, basically started to make money hands over fist, and miraculously we built it right. So I thought, uh, hey, I am good. You know, so this is easy, and I'm good. And so after, uh, after a while we launched AdWords, I thought, well, now I'm going to do another startup. I'm going to do it in style. So startup number two, uh, 2002 to 2008, uh, I went, I said, I'm not going to accept money except from the best. So I went to Sequoia, and uh, I pitched on Friday, and on Monday I had a term sheet for $6 million. So I thought, yeah, this is easy, and I am good. <laughs> and, then, so, and then after that, I did a Series B and a Series C, and overall we raised about $25 uh, million. And five years uh, later, basically, we, the product still exists, but nobody made any money, except the lawyers. Lawyers always make money <laughs> in this deal. So uh, this was my reaction. <laughs> Why the failure? <laughs> what the hell happened here? <laughs> it seemed so easy, and I thought I was just born to do this. And so I had to do a lot of, a lot of thinking. So with the tail between my legs, uh, I went back to Google, and they took me back because I earned some brownie points. Uh, and I decided to study failure. Uh, and innovation and failure, because also Google, as we will see, you know, they, they don't always hit, uh, have a hit with their products. So uh, for the next couple of years, I actually managed some projects, but I came up with a number of ideas that became prototypic. So I want to start with the law of failure. So the law of failure, there are very many variations, but the overall concept is that most new ideas fail. And you probably heard this statistic, right? Most apps in the App Store just lay there, don't make money. More startups lose money. Most innovative technologies fail in the market. Most restaurants close within three years. Most books do not make enough money to recover their costs. So failure is all around us. And as if that's not bad enough, there is an interesting corollary, corollary to the law of failure. And that is, uh, most new ideas fail, even if they're very well implemented. And this is one of the lessons that I've learned. Because if I compare my two startups, the first one raised $3 million from a VC that was not a first year like Sequoia. I didn't know what I was doing. My co-founder didn't know what we were doing, but somehow we were successful. The second startup, Series A from Sequoia, hired top-notch people all over the board, and it did not uh, work. So I started to think a lot about this, uh, this problem. And I don't have any tattoos on my body, but if I did, it would probably be this phrase. Uh, make sure you're building the right it before you build it right. So I, I remember the day it came to me, I immediately went on to Google to say, hey, has anyone else ever said this? Uh, and maybe they've said it, but not in such a way. So I thought, okay, I get to own this. <laughs> and uh, this is my mantra now. Now, when I refer to it, it can be anything. If you think of writing a book, doing a startup, a product, adding a feature, you know, w whatever you want to do. So a use, uh, useful, um, Abbreviation is innovative technology or idea to try. So the law of failure is something that you cannot escape. I mean, it's there. However, 
you can mess around with it. You can use it to your advantage the way that Lady Gaga uses paparazzi, the way that tax accountants use the tax code, right? The law of failure is there. What, why not use it? What happens when you practice pretotapping is what I call the pretotapping effect. Most organizations or most people, they try a few ideas, a lot of them fail very slowly, and occasionally they have a hit, right? Because law of failure says most ideas fail, not all ideas fail. So with pretotapping, what happens is you get to try a lot more ideas, but you're going to have very fast failure, and because of that, you're going to have more time to try new things, and you end up having more successes. Now, this applies whether you're a startup and you're pivoting like crazy. You're all familiar with the term pivoting by now, right? Uh, or if you're a company like Google, where I work, where we can decide, well, let's spend two years and $20 million on a particular project, or let's try many little projects before we launch them. And you see, these have dramatic impact on the result. Now, I have an, a manifesto. Everybody has to have a manifesto. We're not going to cover all of this, but I'm going to cover the first three points, starting with innovators beat ideas. Now, uh, most organizations, you know, uh, people and uh, entrepreneurs, they focus on ideas. They want the next billion dollar ideas. Uh, it's all around the idea. Thank you. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, what is the real value of ideas? And because I'm a, an engineer as well as an entrepreneur, I thought, I should be able to sell my ideas. So where is, I have my prop in here. So I'm, I'm clearly not Steve Jobs. But I've, I've done a few good things in my life. I've, I've had two successful startups. I won the uh, Wall Street Journal Technology Innovation Award in 2005. So I thought, all right, I may not a Steve Jobs league guy, but I should be able to sell a billion dollar idea. So I'm going to try to sell this idea to you. It's seal. I'm going to try to sell it for $1,000. There are some disclaimers. Don't read them. Uh, they, they probably say, you know, you will be sued if you implement this idea by somebody because everybody's suing everybody. I cannot guarantee it to be original. But if you can make it happen and build it, probably it's worth a billion, a billion dollars. So anybody willing to offer $1,000? OK. One of these days, I will sell it. So I thought, well, maybe $1,000 is too much. What if I try to sell ideas cheap in the most vulgar, cheap trading place in the world, Craigslist. Uh, so I tried to sell my ideas on Craigslist for 10 bucks. And uh, if you have ever used Craigslist, you can imagine the replies I get. Uh, I, I received a few replies, uh, most of them illegal in 49 states. Uh, <laughs> nobody wanted to buy my idea. So this is the first thing that I have about ideas. When I talk to entrepreneurs, there is all this concern about, I don't want to share my ideas. I want people to sign NDAs. Ideas literally are worthless in my opinion. And if you think they are worth something, find me somebody who's going to put money and pay for them. So this is my first attack on ideas. But the second attack is much more uh, relevant to you. And that is that ideas live in a place I call Thoughtland. So Thoughtland, if you've ever seen those little kid shows on TV, you know, everybody's happy. And you have an idea. An idea is an abstraction. And if I give you an abstraction uh, as an idea, the most you can give me back is an opinion. Right? And an opinion is not only abstract, it's also subjective. So if you have ideas, the most you can collect with them is opinions. And this is very dangerous because they're abstract and they're subjective. And they're dangerous to innovators and entrepreneurs in two, in two ways. First of all, in Thoughtland, every idea can be a winner. Now, have you guys studied WebVan? Should be a case study. Anybody here doesn't know it? Oh, all right. So very quickly, WebVan around bubble time, say 1999, 2000, they thought, hey, this internet thing is going to be huge. Why don't we allow people to order groceries online? And we deliver them to their door within a 30-minute window that they select. So people liked the idea. They really liked the idea. Silicon Valley, I mean, uh, Sandy Road investors, everybody thought, <laughs> nice. Who wouldn't want to have groceries delivered? I mean, who enjoys going to Lucky and buy uh, groceries? So guess what? They went to Sandy Road. VCs were fighting over each other. Uh, and they ended up raising, I forget how much, but you know, in the $100 million plus range. So they bought huge refrigerated warehouses, they bought tons of food, hired a fleet of van drivers, bought a lot of vans. And then, you know, pretty much what happened. It's the poster child of the bubble, right? Even though everybody told them it's a great idea. How many people here regularly use something like WebVan? Not a lot, right? And remember, everybody told them, yes, this is a great idea. So the first bad thing that can happen if you just deal in ideas is you get false positives. Now, there's something else that happens, and I think this is even more pernicious. And that is, 
uh, false negatives. Now, be honest, the first time you heard about Twitter, how many of you just didn't get it? OK, good. I, I, I did not get it five years ago, I think the first time I heard it. So as you probably know, legend has it, the, the Twitter guys went to their board. Everybody said, yes, it doesn't make any sense. 140 characters, where are you coming from? And basically, you know what happened. So right now, Twitter is worth, say, $10 billion. And it's not only changing the world, it's changing democracy, right? It's having a huge impact. And yet everybody or enough people thought it was a bad idea. So it's what I would call a false negative. So if you're just dealing with ideas, you have to be very careful because you never know what the opinions yours and those of the other people uh, actually mean. And you can make some gigantic blunder. You can overinvest in bad ideas, which happens a lot, and you cannot invest in good ideas, which also happens a lot. So if you want to innovate, if you want to do a startup, uh, what should be the first rule is don't look for the ideas. Do not focus or fall in love with the ideas, but focus on the innovators or the uh, entrepreneurs. At Google, I run a workshop on uh, innovation. And one of the most fun parts is we do this thing called spot the innovators. So we bring some people on the board and you know, list some products and say, OK, can you trace it back to the people that actually made it happen? Because if you want the next new ideas, don't look for the next new idea. Look for the person who made the idea happen. So I'm going to play a version of Spot the Innovator here and uh, without using Google internal stuff. And the first person who answers gets a free copy of my prototype book, uh, Prototype It. But it's always free, except this I printed and stapled it myself. <laughs> so uh, this person, you have to give me the name. So first person to give me the name. This person was a co-founder of PayPal, was also the, the person who co-founded SpaceX. Uh, I heard somebody say Elon Musk. I have to walk all the way there. OK. <laughs> it's never somebody in the front row. Yes, it's, uh, thank you. It's Elon Musk, and, uh, and then Solar City, and a number of things. So frankly, if you want to innovate, if you want something to happen, you're better off uh, finding somebody like him than buying a database of 10,000 ideas. Uh, at work, we have a database where people, Googlers, submit their ideas. There's over 10,000 ideas. I call it the place where ideas go to die. Right? That's not what you should focus on. So find people, innovators, or entrepreneurs to make things happen. Now, there is a problem, however. Once you have innovators and entrepreneurs, especially if they've been successful in the past, they tend to get a little cocky and overconfident. And they start experiencing what I call the innovator's nightmare, uh, which briefly I describe as spending years and millions, usually it's not your own money, to build and perfect a product that nobody ends up buying. Uh, they end up building what I call pre uh, product types. So here I have just some examples of product types. I changed this because I, I give this presentation to a lot of our Google customers. Uh, so let's look at a, a few of them uh, and the reasoning behind them. So you know, Big has disposable pens, disposable uh, razors, so why not disposable underwear? These are all real products, right? Colgate, line extension, you know, great for toothpaste. And what do you do after you eat? You brush your teeth. I'm oh, sorry, what do you do before you eat? So why don't you get in the frozen food? Uh, can anyone imagine what that frozen chicken tastes like, right? It tastes like uh, mint. Uh, <laughs> bottling companies buy a lot of ads. So I spoke to Coca-Cola and to Pepsi. If I'm speaking to Coke, I show Pepsi clear. If I speak to Pepsi, I show new Coke. But the problem is the same. These are products where two of the wisest Marketing company did all the research, all the focus group, et cetera, and then they launched products that essentially uh, flopped. As an Italian, I'm personally offended by Max Spaghetti. Uh, this should never, uh, should never have happened. <laughs> now, Google has its own share of, uh, of bad failures, too. How many people here remember Google Wave? Yeah, so Google Wave was launched with the biggest hoopla ever. Everybody wanted a copy. Uh, everybody begged for it. Then they used it once, they used it twice, and never used it again. Uh, so we killed it. Uh, we recently killed our Google health effort. In a trillion dollar market, you thought we could do something. Uh, it didn't work. We had Google answer. The list could be very long. Now, I don't put these companies here to make fun of them, because it's actually good. They should try new things. The problem is that for a lot of these things, they, they launch and they make a big deal when a little test, a simple test, could have proven that uh, they would not have been as successful as they would have wanted. So can you avoid the innovator's nightmare? And I would say yes, or at least you can avoid it most of the time if you practice prototyping. 
And by the way, how many people here have read the, uh, the Lean Startup and are familiar with the minimum viable product? Good. So uh, uh, Eric Ries and I know each other. We're, we were with each other's work. And if you've listened to his talk and his background, we came from exactly the same background. We've had some successes and failures, and we thought, what went wrong here, and how could we avoid it? So he came up with Lean Startup and the MVP, Minimum Viable Product. And at the same time, while I was at Google, I came up with prototyping and the, the, the concept of prototyping. So if it sounds familiar, it's very close, but there are enough differences worth um, pursuing. So here's the very boring definition of prototyping, right? Test, validate the market appeal and actual usage with the smallest possible investment of time and money. And if you look at this, you think, well, I've heard this before. It's just a proof of concept, or it's a prototype, or it's an MVP. It's a little different uh, than that. And when I, the, next, the first example I want to give you, when I shared it with Eric, Eric had never heard it before. So it's slightly different than the MVP. Here's the first example. About 30 years ago, IBM was in two ma major businesses. Right? They had business machines and uh, computers. Business machines, I mean typewriters, et cetera, et cetera. Their goal was to have computers reaching everybody. But if you remember, 30 years ago, most managers didn't type. Most people didn't type. Who typed? Programmers, secretaries, writers. So they realized that one of the uh, obstacles to broader adoption of personal computers would be the ability to communicate with it. And it made sense in those days. What if we could invent a technology, speech to text, that would actually allow people to bypass the keyboard altogether? 30 years ago, the technology was not there to make this easy and cheap. So it would have been a massive investment for IBM. So uh, people looked at it and thought, you know, I, I have a feeling that people ask for this, but maybe they don't really want it. Can we do a small experiment, a cheap experiment, to see if they really would buy this product? So they did something very clever. They brought the people that were telling them, of course we will buy this uh, speech to text for $10,000 if you build them. They put them in a room with a microphone, a keyboard, and uh, Sorry, no keyboard and a screen. And so they thought that they had a speech-to-text translator. In reality, what they had, they had a super typist hidden in another room. So to the user, to the potential buyer, they thought that they were testing something that was the, the perfect speech-to-text translator. Right? It had all the nuances and the ability of human beings. How many people have heard this example before? Just a handful, right? Um, so I, I keep asking because I love, when I heard this example, a bit in my brain flipped. And I thought, you know, this is very clever because it's really not a prototype. You're not going to put, IBM is not going to create a, a, a race of small typists and put them into boxes. Uh, it's, a, it's a new beast. So I thought, uh, concepts, if they're different enough and if they're not well known enough, they benefit from a name. So the first name I came up is horrible. I came up with Pretendotype because I thought they were pretending to have built the device. And fortunately, I woke up the next morning and thought, no, that will not work. And I came up with the word prototype, which actually stuck. And people seem to like it because now if you type prototyping into a Google search engine, it doesn't think it's a misspelling. If you type just prototype, it still does. But I'm working on it. So I thought, this is a very interesting thing. Can I find other examples? Uh, but before I did that, I, I looked at what the result was for IBM of this experiment. So before, based on their market research on presenting the ideas and soliciting the opinion from people, uh, their market research indicated if we build the speech-to-text computer, everybody will want it. So most people would buy, and they were talking about $10,000 price. After people had the chance to use it or see other people using it, the results completely flipped. Most people thought, you know, it sounded like a good idea, like Webvan. However, after using it, at the end of the day, my throat is sore. You know, can you imagine how noisy a cubicle situation is if everybody uses it. You cannot dictate confidential memo like, you know, attack Iraq uh, on a speech to text. So as it turns out, people told them, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I hope you haven't built too many of these because actually we don't, we don't want them, right? It's easier to learn, uh, learn how to type. So very uh, valuable lesson. I'll just give you one more example. This uh, I like a lot. Uh, most people here probably don't remember the, the Palm Pilot when it came out. But the person who created the Pound Pilot, Jeff Hawkins, uh, before this, he had his own um, entrepreneur nightmare. He founded a company called uh, Grid Computing, and they came up with this grid pad. It was supposed to be the first iPad-like device. Spent tens of millions of dollars. Uh, beautiful design. It worked very nice, but people just didn't buy it. It was the wrong form factor. It was what I call the wrong it. So he had his innovator's nightmare. So after... Uh, 
licking his wounds. He had an idea for something much smaller, the pilot. But this time he was wise enough and he thought, all right, the last time I managed to, to whip myself and my investors up in a frenzy by telling them that if we build this device, uh, they will buy. This time, let me make sure that I would actually use it. So he went in, into his garage. He got a little piece of wood, some paper sleeves, and a toothpick. And he went around pretending that he actually had built this. It was a completely non-functional model. And he would go around and uh, pretend that it worked. Hi, uh, can we meet tomorrow at noon? Sure. Yeah, play along. Yeah. <laughs> OK, great. Um, and uh, can you give me your phone number so I record it? And I'll put it in the address book. So after two weeks of this pretending, he realized, you know, if this was, wasn't just a piece of wood, I would actually uh, use this device. And, and by the way, keep, um, if you remember this compared to the Newton, notice how little functionality it has. It just implemented the features that he knew uh, would be needed. So these are my, uh, this is what I describe as prototype. And if you are the kind of person that cares about splitting hair and the differences, here's the main difference between prototypes and, and, and prototypes. Now, prototypes are very useful. It's something that you actually you should build uh, because you need to answer a question like, you know, can I build it? Will it work? How much uh, battery will, will it use? However, all of those questions are academic if you cannot answer the first basic question is, does it make sense to build it? If I build it, would I actually use it? And the key advantage you get from prototyping is that you get to fail fast. So I told you about my second startup, the one where I raised $25 million and spent five years at it. Uh, after three years, my co-founder and I started having very, very long walks and looking at each other and say, you know, I don't think this is going to work as well as we thought. I mean, we were selling, but you know, we had to spend a million two to sell one million worth of software. So uh, I'm from Italy, he's from Taiwan, and we thought, you know, we should just go and tell the investors, you know, we, sorry, we made a mistake. I told them, this is the US. They're not going to chase after you as they would in Italy. Uh, <laughs> but, but then we thought, but you know, we're in America, you know, and Americans, quitters never win, and winners never quit. So we did the most noble and American thing. We went and raised 10 more million dollars <laughs> in VC funding <laughs> and spent two more years until the VCs themselves said, OK, we're going to shut it down. We're not going to hurt your kneecaps. You know, we're still friends. Uh, and so at the time, I didn't know about prototyping. But this is when I started to realize, you know, the, the lessons I've learned by building the full-fledged products. It was a very complicated product in the area of code analysis and test automation. It took about 18 months to have a, just a working prototype. I could have learned exactly the same lesson by doing a prototype and see if I could sell it, maybe with three months of investment. We would have learned exactly the same and saved many years and tens of millions of dollars. Because what happens is the more time you spend on an idea, the more you're invested, the harder it is to admit failure. And this happens at the individual level, and it definitely happens at the startup level and at the corporate level. So if you prototype, uh, if you spend minutes, hours, or days, you don't worry too much about admitting failure. But after three years and $25 million, it's very hard to do so. So let me give you some examples of, of prototyping in action. Uh, uh, about two years ago, I announced uh, at Google I was going to give a first Android prototyping workshop, and every, every attendee was going to get an Android prototyping kit. So people thought they were going to get an Android phone. That's why a lot, no, the room was overflowing. <laughs> and instead, I gave them you know, the sticky notes and the words cheap as pen. So uh, some people left the room. Uh, some of them still don't talk to me to these days. But when I explained to them how to use it, uh, they actually liked it. So the way that you would use it, if you have in mind a mobile app, remember what Jeff Hawkins did. Before you spend weeks or months programming, just put it on a little piece of paper or just, you know, just uh, put a sticker on your phone and see if you would actually use it. So uh, over time, people, Googlers developed a lot of apps that they thought they would want to build. This, this was my favorite. It's called Park Jerk. You arrive at work a little late. There's no parking, and somebody takes two parking spots. So they thought, hey, what if we just take a photo of their bad parking with the license plate, and then we publicly shame them on an internal website. Uh, so I said, well, it sounds like a good idea. I, I, I personally prefer to kick their doors in. But uh, if you want to do that, just go ahead and see if you would use it. So we did several of these. And exactly as you would expect, a lot of people, just by having these pretendotypes, this uh, prototype, they realized, you know, it sounded like a good idea. And I could use my imagination to pretend that it worked. But I really would not use it. And 
You know that this uh, actually happens if you go and look in the App Store. 90% of the apps you know, just linger there. You know, they're downloaded a few times. So a lot of people spend a lot of time building products and ideas that people don't want. Now, over time, uh, we've evolved. Uh, since uh, I'm an engineer, I built a tool called Androgen, which later we found out, only later, is actually a male hormone, a synthetic male hormone. Uh, but it sounded like a good name for Android Generator. Uh, this is not public yet. I wanted to show it today, but I didn't get the required permissions. Uh, so Androgen allows you to create applications in minutes, uh, minimum viable products, so they don't have any of the bells and whistles, but they actually work. And you can push them to your friend's phone and iterate very quickly without reinstalling. So this is what we're using now at Google for doing a lot of uh, pre-totapping of ideas. So with Androgen, uh, we're able to build tools like ParkJerk, uh, that talk to the cloud in a matter of minutes. So this is part jerk that we actually built in one of our uh, workshops. Yes? Since a lot of people are actually working on stuff, is there any timing for this coming out? If it was for me, it would be uh, very soon, but uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a time frame. That even like six months, one year, two years? Uh, uh, no, and, and maybe it will never come out. Um, there is a concern that this makes it too easy to create simple apps, and so it will flood the market with too many junk apps, which is a valid concern. There are some other environments, so if you don't want to use the full SDK, either for iOS or for Android, there are tools like Corona that if you have you know, a little bit of programming, you can build uh, applications much more quickly. Uh, so Prito tapping actually works for uh, retail for, for many ideas. I also talked to uh, the Navy, and we had fun Prito tapping a submarine. Uh, a parts of a submarine. So Best Buy, big electronic retailer. I never shopped there, but you know they, uh, they ap apparently have a lot of the business when a new game like a new Xbox 360 Plus 5 comes out, people go there. So they had an idea that when a new PlayStation comes out or one of these new game console comes out, kids would bring their own, trade it in, get a coupon, and go buy it in the store. And the idea was that they would make money by trading in the used one, and also have people go to their store. Now, typically, what would a company do? They, they would come up with a high-level plan, get all approval, and then launch it to all stores. Instead, what they did in these prototyping experiments, Best Buy set up a little tent, probably rented for 200 bucks, did it in one place over one weekend to see if people would actually come and do it, because it's a good idea. And as it turns out, people actually loved the idea. They brought in games. Le they learned valuable lessons that, when kids trade in their uh, game console, they also want to sell the games that they have with it. Uh, and so they went on eBay to find out what they were valued. They really didn't invest anything. And as a result, this actually worked, and they called it, whoops, went one slide too many. They, now it became an actual program, the technology trading. Now, imagine yourself. You, you're coming up with this idea at Best Buy, and you go and present it to the board. On one hand, you can just present the idea, and it can sound good, or they can give you thumbs up or thumbs down. Compare that to actually going in and say, we've actually done experiments over one weekend. You know, we collected 60 game stations, and we sold 50 new ones. You go with data instead of opinions. This is very uh, powerful. Because the mind, we, we can get tricked into developing some really stupid ideas without realizing. And this next slide is my favorite example. And if you have better ones, uh, send them to me. So, I remember seeing this product in an in-flight magazine a few years ago, and I thought, you know, this, I don't know what kind of stomach problem this person had, uh, <laughs> but it must have been pretty serious, and, and, and I was impressed because it's, it's actually built very well. You know, they, they had to pay to get licensing from Apple, you know, license made for iPod. They got the color right. It has two speakers. They had to get the plastic molds. I mean, it's a nicely done product. And he must have convinced himself and other people and investors. I mean, and I look at it and think, yeah, but you know, uh, you know, this person could have invented something actually useful. You know, maybe a, a new type of kidney dialysis machine. It seems such a waste of talent to build products like this. And yet, at some point, if you if you hang around long enough, you probably have ideas that you wake up the next morning. You think, how could I ever think that that's a good idea? So this, along with make sure it's the right it before you build it right has become one of my uh, uh, standard reminders. So at Google, what we do, or what I'm going to try to do going forward, because the, the climate has changed dramatically, instead of brainstorming, you'll, we'll talk about brainstorming. In brainstorming, you deal with ideas. But by now, you realize that ideas 
you cannot sell them, right? They, they don't actually have a value, and they can lead to uh, positive, false positive or, or false negatives. So instead, we practice Preto storming. And another term you probably heard of hackathons, where you bring people in the room and you spend two days. Try to build something. Don't tell me about it. Build a simple version of it, and let's see if you would actually, uh, we would actually use it. When we do Preto storming, there are a lot of techniques that I discuss in the book. By the way, I'll send uh, a PDF of all these slides and a PDF of the, of the book. So, um, you can look at them in detail. So if you have a product or a startup in mind, these are just some of the techniques that you can uh, use. Uh, one of them is called the Mechanical Turk prototypes. You're probably familiar with this uh, example, right? That this thing called the Mechanical Turk. It looked as if it was playing chess m automatically, but there was a little chess player inside moving the piece. So this is particularly useful every time you want to create a, a startup or actually a, a, a product that requires a lot of uh, say, artificial intelligence or calculation or, or compute power behind it. Uh, let's assume you want to do an app where you can just take a snap uh, of your lunch and it tells you, you know, it's a healthy lunch or a bad lunch and it tells you how many calories you've eaten. Now, to actually build the back end to do that analysis, it's very expensive. But what, if I had to do this now, I would just send a photo and at the back end, I would have some couple of students or interns or even a nutritionist just entering the feedback. Because what I want to know at that point is not whether I can build it, which I'm pretty sure I can, but whether people would actually use it. And by the way, I did this experiment with the lunch, you know, rate my lunch application. And one of the things we learned is that people consistently forget. You know, you're just halfway through your lunch and you remember, oh, I should have taken a photo of it. Does anybody here do that? No. And uh, chances are, it sounds good, but it's one of those things that you will not do. Or maybe you cheat. So you take a photo of your salad, and then you forget to do the brownie. Uh, and these are all lessons that you can learn before building you know, a $10 million AI backend. The, the Pinocchio prototype, every time there is a form factor issue, you know, before you actually build the thing, try to build a version of it, even if it's not functional, and fill in the blanks with your imagination, pretending. Now we come to a real fun one. I, don't, I didn't invent this name. The fake door was uh, another entrepreneur. Uh, and... Uh, Fake door is pretty interesting. Uh, essentially, you try to see if you can sell the product by doing things like putting ads and see if anybody clicks on them. Have other people heard of this process idea before? Yes. Okay. So uh, when I people kept asking me, I've given this presentation a lot of time, so you should write the book. And I thought, yes, good idea. But writing a book takes months, if not years. So I bought the uh, AdWords for prototype it and find out if people clicked on it. You know, enough people clicked on it that I wrote the little prototype book. Uh, so very powerful technique. This doesn't have to be just AdWords. If you want, think of adding a feature to an enterprise system, just put it there and see if people click on it or you know, just announce a store. Um, you get the idea. A lot of people are nervous about this because it doesn't sound very ethical, uh, even though you can do it uh, in ethical ways. So the next step is, you should all be familiar, the minimum viable product, the term that Eric Ries of the Lean Startup uh, popularized. So what, I've, what I did, I wrote a minimum viable product of the book, you know, did it in one week, stapled it uh, uh, myself to see if people actually like it, and uh, then get the feedback if it's worth building the actual uh, product. One night stands. Now, uh, I talked to a lot of our, the large Google customers, and large companies think that if they do something, they should do it for eternity and you know, throughout the world. In reality, if you have an idea, there's nothing wrong with trying in, in just one locale and do it, say, for a weekend or a month and see if it actually sticks. Somehow, most large companies are very much against uh, this idea. And the one-night-stand one one stand prototype is a good example. In personator prototypes, you can take, if you're uncomfortable doing the, uh, the fake door, you can take an existing product, put a wrapper around it, and then present it as some other product. So, Let's assume, for example, that a company wants to have a version of Salesforce. I'm just making this example up. They want to do something that's like Salesforce, but uh, it's just for the iPad, and it has this cool interface. Well, maybe they can just put a wrapper around an existing Salesforce thing without actually building the back end and see if it, uh, if it would work. Now, why do we prototype? Well, we prototype because uh, data beats opinion. And our opinions, as we've seen, can be uh, very wrong. In the past, uh, you know, ideas have low credibility. If you build a prototype, at least you show people that you're able to build things. Uh, but at Google, at least, 
nothing succeeds like going with user to data. If I have a new idea for an app or a product, if I give the idea, I don't get much credibility. If I go and show, hey, I launched this to 1,000 Googlers last month, and now 4,000 people are using it regularly, you get a lot of credibility. Now, how do you measure uh, whether something is going to be a hit or a flop? I came up with this uh, acronym called FLOP and a metric to go along with it. These are the three ways that most products can fail. They fail because of launch, meaning you know, your marketing is bad, or you're, you're launching the wrong market or at the wrong time. They fail because the operation, they don't operate well. People like the idea, but it doesn't work. Or the worst one, just the idea is, is bad. right? It works well, you've done a great launch, but the idea is bad. And the way that you measure hit or flop, this is greatly simplified, I go into it in more detail in the book, is pick a small sample. Right? So let's take the idea for Rate My Meal app. Uh, you send, uh, if I wanted to test it at Google, I would send an email to 1,000 random Googlers, see how many would actually click or download it. So this gives me the initial level of interest. If nobody downloads it, it's pretty clear. If three people download it, it's still a pretty you know, bad idea. If 500 download it, I think, well, this has potential. Uh, and then what I do is I follow their uh, ongoing usage because it's very easy to sell something once, right? Anybody who's seen late night commercial, uh, commercials, you know, the infomercial, you see some of the stupidest products, and I've actually bought a couple myself, right? Because, you know, they buy once and you don't have to buy them again, like Ginsu knife or food dehydrators, right? Where you take, here's the business premise of a food dehydrator. Take $20 of fresh, juicy fruit, put them in this $200 food dehydrator, apply two kilowatts of powers, and come up with you know, $3 of dried prunes. Just doesn't make any sense. However, late at night at 1 AM, people think, yes, I would like to dehydrate my food. You know. uh, <laughs> pasta makers, Ginsu knives, you know, there are a lot of things that fall into that category. Of course, you cannot build an ongoing, reputable business. How many people here want to go into infomercials? No, OK. But you know, actually, it could work. It could be fun. Some of them actually work. So you want to make sure that people do come back. And as you can imagine, I'm not going to bother you with all the possible ratios of initial level of interest to ongoing level of interest. You can do any analysis you want yourself. But remember, use data and not opinion to decide whether you want to go ahead. Now, um, think about Webvan. Remember, this is a perfect example. On Thoughtlands, everybody thought it was a great idea. But what happened when they launched it? Very few people tried it. So where did it fail? Uh, was it failure of the launch? No, because everybody knew about Webvan at the time. It was the high, most, uh, uh, highest hype company of the, uh, of the period. Was it a failure in operation? No, it actually worked stupendously well. The website was elegant. They delivered the food as promised. It was the premise that was bad. Maybe the timing was wrong, or people just didn't. People like to go shop, or they don't like to order the steaks uh, through Webvan. So, a little experiment we'll do later, you could have found this out much cheaper. Now, uh, this is close to my heart because it, it really hurt me as a Googler. What happened with Wave? Uh, you all heard about it, right? So, no? Just, okay, one person hasn't heard about it. Google, two, two so Google Wave was supposed to replace uh, email. It was the next big thing. We announced about two years ago. Most people have heard about it, right? And you know there was a lot of hype. So it was announced probably the biggest launch uh, of Google prior to the, the ones in, in this year. So everybody wanted it. People begged me for an invitation. However, when they uh, launched it, people tried it once, tried it twice, and they never, never came back. Right? So in this case, it wasn't a problem with the launch. Probably a problem with the operations was very confusing, and also the premise. I guess for some things, email works just as well, the same way the keyboards work uh, uh, as well as speech. Uh, what does a success look like? High level of initial interest, a lot of ongoing interest. Uh, and a hit doesn't have to have huge market share to be a hit. You know, the, the MacBooks are a good example. So the way that I want to do things more at Google in the future so we avoid waves is to do this very fast iteration, you know, the internal version of the, of the Lean Startup through pre-totyping. Select a number of Googlers, say 1,000. See if it sticks with them, and if not, keep iterating or kill the projects. This would have, discovered, would have prevented us from launching wave uh, at the time. Now, uh, in closing, because I want to leave some time for questions, I want to make sure that the ideas sink in. So let's try to prototype some of these ideas now that you have the concept. And I will give a, a book to somebody who can prototype uh, Webvan. 
So now that you know, WebVan, remember, they spent $100 million to launch it. And they learned something they could have learned, say, for $1 million. How would you prototype WebVan? Anybody? Good, so that's a part of it. Do you still need a nice website? Okay, yeah. Uh, would you buy any van? Sorry, well, let's. No, I, I was going to say, on the website, just let them type whatever they want. Okay. Okay. It's pretty cheap. Okay. The question would be whether they try to get in a third time. So. The question is whether to get somebody or their money. Oh, that's right. If, if they would come back, yes. Perfect. Yes, very good. So it's a combination of all these techniques. So we have a, uh, a mechanical Turk. Maybe the website is not, you don't have to have a huge database, right? Somebody can read the orders coming in. Phones, the body who goes to the store. Uh, and yes, you do it in one place, right? If you do it in Mountain View or Palo Alto and it doesn't work, do you think it's going to work in some, maybe it will work in San Francisco because it's different, but they would have learned the same lessons very, very cheaply instead of having spent $100 million. Uh, Max Spaghetti, there is a beautiful prototype for this. How would you prototype Max Spaghetti? Excuse me? Okay, you're, in the, you're the McDonald manager. You're in a store. Uh, your grad school didn't pay off. Your, your schlepping burgers at McDonald's. You want to prototype Max Spaghetti. How would you do? Put it on the menu and just see if someone orders it, whether or not. Okay, good. Can I give it to him because they were, okay, I'll give one to you and one to him. Come afterwards, have it in. I can give it to him? We'll share. We'll share. All right. Uh, so OK, but this answers the first part. You know, prototype it sounds simple. So the first time you, you put it on the menu, if somebody tells you, can I have it, you say you're out. Now, if you're the cashier, you're taking the order, um, then I'm upset as a customer. What, do you do? what can you do for me? Yeah, something like that. Right, so you don't, you don't want to upset your customer. Now it gets complicated. So there are two possible scenarios. One is people actually ask for it. Say out of 1,000 people, 200 ask for it, uh, and people don't ask for it. Now, in the case they ask for it, you need to know if they would order it again. So how would you do the next step? Or if anyone else wants to think. Mm, no, not quite. All right, so if, well, but actually, if the initial level of interest, you find out just by putting it on the menu, right? Then you actually need to cook some spaghetti. So uh, just like the gentleman said, do it just in one or two stores. Actually, prepare the item as you would. And then as a cashier, you have to ask a very important question every time somebody orders it. And the question is, is this the first time you order this? Because as with the Mac ribs, disgusting thing, uh, right? People will order everything, <laughs> anything once. So if you want to know if you have an ongoing level of interest, you have to see, hey, people order it, and they keep ordering it. So in that case, it's worth making an investment. Uh, now, this is my favorite example because beverage companies screw this up so badly every time. Uh, bottle water for pets. Now, how would a, <laughs> how would a uh, beverage company approach this? Since we're running a bit out of time, I'm going to shrink. I'm going to tell you. A beverage company, what they would do, they would bring a group like this in the room. Let's all pretend that you are pet owners. You are uh, pet owners. Uh, I create a focus group, right? And so you're all pet owners. Then I'm going to ask you, Hi, uh, you drink bottled water? Yeah. Uh, do you feed your cat fluffy bottled water? No. You're a very bad person, <laughs> right? So the, the create <laughs> <laughs> they create this artificial environment where people will pretty much agree to anything because you know somebody came up the idea and they want to reinforce that. And that's how you came up with some lame ideas like uh, Pepsi Clear or uh, Pepsi Clear is a good example. I right? remember Pepsi launched several years ago, was well, just like Pepsi without any of the coloring or things. And of course, you have people in the focus group and you tell them, wouldn't you rather not eat you know, 46 chemicals with every sip or Pepsi? And in a focus group, they would say, yes, of course. And then they go at the store and they don't pick it up. So that's how a lot of companies do it. How would you do it now that you know prototyping? How would you test bottled water for pets? Yes? Just keep it in a few stores and see if anyone buys it. OK, yeah. W would you actually uh, get your own bottles or thing, or just slap some labels that you made at home? Yes, OK. 
Yeah, so you go to a Petco, you make a deal, say, and don't give it away for free, right? You put it there in the shelf, see if people pick it up and pay mo real money for it and see if they keep coming back. So these are just some of the high-level ideas of prototyping. So which brings me to the conclusion. Uh, if you want to be an innovator, if you want to have, be an entrepreneur, you need to have vision, right? You need to have courage. You have to have ideas and you have to have opinions. I made fun of them, but they are necessary. However, if you want to maximize your chances for success, uh, through prototyping, what you do is you try to match each of these with their uh, more concrete counterparts. So your vision matches with reality, ideas with prototypes, opinions with data. What's more powerful for me to tell you, hey, I think that people will buy bottled water for pets, or to show you, hey, I put it in five different stores, and after one week, you know, they, they sell 100 per week. So it's much better to sell uh, with data than ideas. And when you have this, you have innovation and entrepreneurship that uh, is... Uh, more likely to succeed, and you will have fewer innovators. Nightmare. So this ends the talk, and I, my favorite part is the question. Thank you. What do you think of companies like Color that they, I'm, I'm sure they're pretty aware of all of these yeah. new approaches. Right, they raise 40 million and the president's working, but on their hand, you can argue that they really know what they're doing and they're just iterating. At one point, they're going to come up with some video technology. Where, but uh, many people are laughing and like, okay, this is an web panel of the more than 40 million. Yeah. So, for those of you who don't know color, right, and the, the counterpart is Instagram, right? Yeah. So, Instagram was just a pivot to say, hey, let's try this. Uh, you know how many employees Instagram has? Four. No, eight. They're up to eight. <laughs> And, you know, I don't know how many, 250 million users. You know, re really a bootstrap effort. Color, right, it was placed in the same area. But because the, the founder of Color was a successful entrepreneur before, uh, they were able to raise more money and make uh, big plans. And they came up with this thing, Color, which kind of flopped as much as uh, 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 Instagram succeeded. Right. So what happened in that case, you could argue that if you can get VCs to give you $40 million, maybe you should always take it. And... Uh, and then try to come up with new things and, uh, you know, and readjust. However, I bet you that if you ask them if they had to do it all over again, they would have tried on a much smaller scale and not to make, have a such big public launch just to fall flat uh, on their face. So it's very rare that you want to go uh, ahead before prototyping. Yes, one and then two. That's right. Yeah, so this app, it's, it's featureitis, right? If you ask customers, they just come up with this list of features and then they don't use. That's why you start with the minimum viable product. And the way it works is in, inside every product, there is a very small version of the product that actually does the important thing, right? In the case of Instagram, take a photo, apply cool filter, share it with, uh, with people. So what I always do is I start with the minimum viable product, and then you notice I take feedback from people that actually use the product uh, and then complain about it. Complaints are the strongest form of feedback, especially if they're based on actual users. Say, Alberto, this is great, but it takes eight seconds to upload a photo, or you know, I want the black and white filter. So you add features when they're requested from people that have used them. I never add a feature if somebody asks who hasn't used uh, the product. And by the way, in addition to adding features, you should also remove features. You know, I have metrics in all of my products. Nobody ever clicks on a filter. Just get rid of that filter altogether. Oh, sorry, one, one and then two. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how do you apply this, uh, this uh, technique to social startups? So companies which, which actually require hundreds of people and a yeah. community to, to judge whether this, this is making sense or not. Yeah, good. So uh, how do I apply to social startups or, or, or more complicated things? Well, first I'd like to bring up the fact that uh, Facebook did prototype, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't go and raise money. They didn't go and buy computers. They just literally bootstrap and uh, use a university computer uh, and, and crash it. So they started that way. They started with a small group. Uh, and essentially, they did prototype. You just start with a smaller social group and see if it works for that, right? If it doesn't work for university students, maybe it works for families. But if it doesn't work for university students and family, then probably doesn't work on a larger scale. Uh, and, 
every time I give this presentation, people come up with interesting counterexamples of, well, you couldn't prototype a car. So now, how many people think that Tesla, you know, Tesla, the electric car, was actually prototyped? Do you think it was prototyped or not? Yeah, that's, that's one part, yeah, so th th there is some of that, but there is an even simpler pro prototype that had a fake door. If you remember, Tesla asked people for $5,000 deposit for their Roadster. Now, that's the equivalent, right, of the fake door prototype. They weren't an established car company. Nobody knew if they actually could build it in mass, but imagine going to the VCs or the investors and telling them, you know, it may be crazy, but here I have evidence, you know, 2,000 people gave, gave us $5,000 just to have this thing, so to me, that's a very powerful uh, first door. So typically, in every business, you can find something simpler than building the full-fledged product. Yes, sir. If I want to give back, let's say, on a product proposal like Calendar, uh, how can I prepare based on that, like an add-on? <coughs> well, I, I need a specific example, but may, you, you're thinking use the back end of the actual Google Calendar. Yeah, you can create yeah, your own yeah. interface. Uh, well, the type of prototype depends on the actual product since you're not telling me I cannot do it. But I would find that and then you probably have 10 friends who have 10 friends, right? And you launch it to a group of people or maybe your, your, your fellow students you know, in college and see if they actually would use it, not once if they would keep coming back. And remember, in most cases they won't, right? Most of your ideas are not going to succeed. And that's one part of the muscle that you need to develop. Just get used to failure. And actually, I enjoy failure as much as I enjoy uh, success these days. The thing that drives me crazy is the ambiguous result, right? You launch something you know, to 1,000 people. If you get three people who want it, you know it's not worth it. But what happens when you have 100 people? Then you're kind of caught into that uh, middle ground. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions. No, I think we are done. So th thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And may you find the right it. <laughs>